Hey Curious Minds, I'm Dr Becky, welcome back to my channel and this week I thought we'd do something a little bit different. So I thought I'd kind of do a vlog of what projects I have been working on and what research I've been up to. Because some of you might remember that I went observing back in May and you might be wondering why did you go observing, what for, what was the data that you got at the end of your a night in the life of an astronomer video and so today I thought I'd tell you all about that. Now this is work on a project that I've been doing with Brooke Simmons from Lancaster and Chris Lintock from Oxford as well. So let's start with the why we went observing. Now I'm really interested in how supermassive black holes grow and evolve with their galaxies. So we think there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. And the idea and the most accepted theory is that you have a merger of two galaxies, which you will then presumably have a merger of the two supermassive black holes in the center. But also you'll probably destroy any of that beautiful spiral structure that you see in galaxies, exchange angular momentum and energy between stars and make a lot of stuff sink to the center of that galaxy where you will probably also feed the black hole again but you'll also form what we call a bulge in the center of a galaxy so you can kind of think of it as kind of like a fried egg like the white with the yellow yolk in the middle like you can see that really really strongly in a lot of galaxies and so basically what we think is that merger equals black hole growth and bulge growth and we see that in very tight correlations between the mass of the bulge of a galaxy and the mass of the supermassive black hole, or the weight of the supermassive black hole. And the same thing for the total mass in a galaxy and the supermassive black hole mass as well. So what about galaxies that don't have bulges? So we had a sample of those galaxies, about a hundred of them selected from about a million galaxies. So they're very, very rare, uh, at least those with active supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes that you can detect because they're currently accreting material, they've got a, a material spiraling around them that's glowing because of the energy that's coming off of a black hole. Now that might sound weird to a lot of people because you know black holes don't give off light, you know, anything that falls into a black hole is lost. But actually when you have material spiraling around a black hole, there's a lot of radiation pressure and pressure because of gravity from around the black hole. And so a lot of it doesn't make it into the black hole and instead it gets thrown out in jets or in outflows and energy can hit the gas and cause it to glow and that's how we can see that there is a, a supermassive black hole there that's currently active. We call that an active galactic nuclei. So we had a sample of galaxies that had these active galactic nuclei in bulgeless galaxies so kind of you know missing the yolk and egg white omelette if you will. And what we wanted to do with them was measure the black hole mass. You know, how heavy are these things? Are they as heavy as a galaxy that has grown its bulge and has a massive bulge in the center? Or are they piddly? You know, and, and I mean piddly in like relative terms for astronomy because I'm talking about like tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun as opposed to like a million or a billion times the mass of the sun. So piddly. And so we went observing back in 2014 to observe how big are the black holes in these galaxies. And we were looking at the gas around the black hole because if it's spiraling, it, some of it's gonna be blue shifted and some of it's gonna be red shifted away from you. So you can figure out how fast it's going around the black hole and therefore how big the thing that it's going around is. So you can measure the mass of the black hole. And so with that, we found that actually you find the exact same correlation for these galaxies between total mass and black hole mass and that they were as big as something that's had a merger and, and grown its black hole to like a billion times the mass of the sun you could find these in these bulgeless galaxies as well so it challenged that accepted theory for you grow black holes in mergers because we were seeing just as big black holes in a bulgeless galaxy that had clearly never had a merger the other thing that the data we got from the Palmer observing trip back in 2014, it showed that around one of the signatures of the black hole in what we call the spectra of the galaxy. So when you take the light from a galaxy and you split it through a prism and you sort of see its rainbow and you see all the signatures in that galaxy of, of the stars and, and the AGN. So one of those features is called O3. It's an oxygen emission line and it mainly comes from um, emission from the black hole that's strong enough to excite oxygen, you know, uh, raise electrons around oxygen above their energy level and make them drop back down to give off light. And so if you get that signature in a galaxy, you'll see a very uh, sort of strong spike, a very specific wavelength from oxygen. And so we did see that 
Except we also saw this extra component, like we couldn't describe it with sort of a simple, nice, normal curve. We could only describe it if there was an extra component there. And also that extra component was blue shifted as well, which means whatever that was, whatever the extra oxygen light was, it was coming towards us with respect to the rest of the galaxy. And so that suggested that there was what an outflow from these growing black holes in these bulgeless galaxies, which is really kind of cool because the reason we were studying them, these bulgeless galaxies, is what you want to be able to do is constrain what process is building these black holes. So you need to know how much mass is coming into the black hole, the inflow rate, if you will. Now the inflow is inflow plus black hole accretion rate plus outflow. So you can't constrain that inflow and say, well, it might be this process because we can get this much inflow rate from this alone, because if you only measure the accretion rate of the black hole, you've got that outflow component as well. It might be giving off more mass than it's actually accreting. And so it might be some other process that's growing these black holes in these bulgeous galaxies. You know, you might have something like uh, the spiral arms internally in the galaxy are funneling gas towards the black hole. Or you see some galaxies with like a bar structure in the middle and maybe gas is flowing along that bar to the black hole as well. Like this was the kind of thing that we were speculating in our previous paper. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to observe how much mass was in this outflow alone. Now to do that, we had to do a special way of observing. We had to say all we want is the light around that feature. We don't want any light from the rest of the spectrum, we just want light there. And so we can use a very special filter that only lets in that amount of light, just like you would put like a red filter on a lamp to make only red light come through. We can just let that specific wavelength or color of light come through with these filters as well. So we wrote what's called a telescope proposal. We wrote to the people who manage all the time on telescopes and said, please give us this amount of time on this telescope because we have this core sample of galaxies. They have weird black hole masses that we can't explain. And we want to be able to observe the outflow. And we want to be able to observe the outflow from these galaxies with the narrow band filters that you have available at the observatory. And the ultimate goal was to get how much light is coming through in that feature around oxygen. And so then you just get the emission from the central black hole and the outflow as well. But then that sort of shifted up from zero a certain amount by just emission from galaxy as a whole. So you also need uh, to know how much light is coming from the, what we call the continuum, the sort of galaxy level by observing just a little bit sort of along from that feature as well. And then you can subtract the two and just get left with the black hole and the outflow. And then you can be like, okay, so how bright is that? Uh, outflowing gas, therefore how much mass of gas must be in there, how big is it, make some assumptions on like how um, fast the, the emission from the black hole has been traveling, so then you can put like a, a rate of emission from the black hole on that outflow. And then you're left with, like I said, accretion rate of the black hole you can measure from the brightness of that central emission, and then you've got inflow, outflow, accretion rate, and you can say, okay, so maybe we're getting like five solar masses or masses of the sun per year uh, outflowing from the black hole. The accretion rate of the black hole is like three solar masses a year. So we need eight solar masses per year somehow inflowed to that black hole. What processes can do that? And perhaps it's kind of like a slow and steady like growth of the black hole rather than like a catastrophic like merger event that comes in and just destroys everything and grows it really big, really quickly in like a short space of time. So we put this proposal in for time to the telescope committee and they said, yep, we like that. Here's three nights in May, go observing. So I went to California to get this data, which was a fantastic experience. Like if anybody lives uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose, like I really encourage you to actually go visit up at the observatory up there because it is so beautiful and they have a, a visitor center and it's fantastic because there's all the history of astronomy that's been done there. There's been a lot of standards for astronomy observed there and a lot of these features, these emission and absorption features in galaxy spectra and star spectra that have been defined at the Lick Observatory. And there's all these posters everywhere for astronomers up on the mountain that are like, beware snakes and beware mountain lions. I'm like, that's great, but it's gonna be dark most of the time I'm up there, the most of the time that I'm awake. So I'm not gonna be able to see if there's a mountain lion stalking me or a snake stalking me. It definitely puts a damper on uh, going outside at night and looking at the sky because you're terrified that you're gonna become like a mountain lion's next meal while you're up there. But data was still obtained 
maintained despite mountain lions. So I'm gonna show you now like what some of those images actually looked like. So to the office. Welcome to the office. This is where the magic happens. Very exciting, very excited to have like my own office now as well. Um, but what I wanted to show you um, was what the raw images look like. So uh, this is a galaxy here. So this is one of the ones that we observed. I dubbed this um, Hermione because I wanted to name them after all um, Harry Potter characters. Um, but you can see, you can see the, the central, very bright spot of the galaxy. You can see um, this sort of bar feature running through the galaxy. You know, you saw, you can, and also you can see the spiral arms as well around the galaxy, which is kind of cool. You also see that it's, it's kind of noisy. There's like lots of speckle in the background. You can see like the ring of where the filters let light in as well, which is kind of cool. But I can play with the scale on this image, that's what I'm gonna do here, and I can play with the scale to make sure that the noise sort of disappears out. I like lower which one sort of like level you actually see in the image so you can see the galaxy a bit clearer. So this is what it looks like raw. So there's lots and lots of sources of noise in this image though. So um, sources of noise include like um, just the response of the actual detector itself. You have to be able to um, sort of take what's called a dark noise field where you, like close the shutter and all you do is literally expose a CCD with nothing there and you'll get noise in the detector. You then also got like what's called the bias, which is the response of the detector as well, which is kind of like how much light it detects in certain places on the detector. You've got to remove that. You've got to remove noise from the sky as well. So like the sky will be glowing from light pollution and just from general emission as well, like reflected light through the atmosphere. You have to remove that from the image. So there's a lot to do to the images before you can even analyze them properly. Another thing, cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are well annoying to an astronomer. You have to remove them all the time. They're like little like hot pixels that are just really bright on your image and you have to try and remove those as well. So lots and lots to do to the images. Um, so those are the things that I've already done to the image. So I'll show you what one of those looks like. So let's just bring this back up on uh, the computer. Um, so this is what like a reduced image of that same galaxy looks like. You can see it in so much more detail now. I've also like labeled where the very central brightest point of the galaxy is in that central bit. So that is the image that has been reduced for the sky noise and the re noise and the bias noise and everything around that oxygen three emission line, like in the galaxy. And so we should be probing there like stuff that is coming from the galaxy and the black hole as well. And then if I scroll over, you can see the image which is taken of just the galaxy itself. So like that's all like the background light from stars just around that wavelength. And so what we're gonna do is take this image off this other image as well and then see what we're left with and see if we can see anything that's like outside of the black hole and that we can say, okay, this isn't coming from the central bit of the AGN, this is actually an outflow. So next step still to do, that's what's on my list for today. <laughs> There's still a lot for me to do. I still have to calibrate the images where you actually set, turn sort of counts on the detector into like real energy units that you're getting in terms of the energy given off by the gas in the image gonna do that by using what's called standard stars. So standard stars are very well observed stars. We know exactly how much energy they give out across their entire wavelength range. So we observe those um, throughout the night as well through all the narrowband filters. So we could say this is how much energy you get through the filter for this exposure time. I still have to subtract, you know, that nice continuum galaxy level from the main image as well, just to see what we get left with and see if we can actually pick out the outflow itself from that central component, like have we got good enough data to do it? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. And see how many we actually detect these things in as well, because we might sort of have duds with a lot of them. We might not be at the right sort of observing angle to actually pick it out from the central component. It might be coming directly towards us. We just don't know. So it's gonna be a paper that sort of outlines all of the steps that we've taken to analyze the data. It's gonna explain all the background of the sample as well, the publication that we end up with, and then hopefully be like, hey, here's this outflow we detected, therefore what process is actually driving this? So I'm really excited to actually put all this down on paper or in pixels, if you will, like on a computer and share it with the scientific world once it's done. And until then, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys what the journey has been like, what has it been like analyzing the data. It's been a bit frustrating until now because it's been a bit of a learning curve. And also it's a kind of a side project. So I'm doing this along with 
all my other research projects that I'm working on at the minute too. So I'll try and update you guys every couple months or so to just let you know how it's going. But until then, Dr. Becky, over and out.